Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to INSEAD's webinar series. Tonight, we have the pleasure of hosting two alumni from the secondary market space. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the seminar. We have over 80 countries signed up, uh, UK, France, Singapore, US, and Germany being the top five. So good morning, good evening, and uh, good afternoon to all of you. My name is Claudia Zeisberger. I'm a professor for entrepreneurship at INSEAD and uh, as the academic director of its private equity uh, center, I look after any work we do in the private capital market space. So with that, let me move on to uh, Collar Capital and uh, welcome our um, panelists, Francois and Katrina. So Collar Capital is one of the largest uh, leading investors in the secondary market space. Founded already in the 90s, they were one of the first funds to experiment with the idea of secondary investments. Nowadays, over 200 employees, 80 of them in the, um, uh, in the investment team. And with that, they're one of the largest teams on the secondary space. They're managing a total of 17 billion of uh, uh, assets under management. And uh, their latest, their most recent fund has a total of 7 billion in terms of AUM. With that, I would like to invite Katrina and Francois. So first, thank you very much for joining us um, on, uh, for this webinar, for making time for that. Katrina, tell us a little bit about yourself before we kick off with the, uh, with the agenda. Sure. So as Claudia said, I'm Katrina Lau. Um, I've they post my undergrad, well, I'm an investment principal at Collar Capital, but post my undergrad and graduate degree in the US, I began my career as a CPA at Ernst & Young um, with clients uh, such as hedge funds and private equity. After that, I went on to a private equity manager in New York. I was uh, at NCI 2010, 11J, um, and after NCI, I went to Collar Capital. I started at Collar Capital um, in the investor relations and fundraising team for a year and a half, raised our sixth fund, and moved over to the investment team over seven years ago. Uh, and at Collar, I basically focused on originating, executing transactions in the secondary space. Okay, Francois, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Katrina. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I hope first and foremost, obviously, I hope everyone um, is, uh, is doing fine uh, during those, uh, those moments and, and your families uh, as well. Um, so as you can see, I'm an MBA of five, so I'm still very hopeful uh, to be able to celebrate my 15th anniversary in Singapore in November. Fingers crossed on, on this one. Um, I joined Collar um, just before the financial crisis uh, in uh, 07. So I've been uh, in secondary sports some time. Um, at the time when the industry was really uh, picking up uh, and taking off. Um, so I'm one of the uh, senior partners there, focused specifically on uh, investments uh, around, the, around the globe, uh, some focus in Europe, uh, but it's quite, quite global as an approach. And I'm very involved with INSEAD in many aspects. Okay, thank you very much. So now that you met all of us, um, I wanted to do a quick poll to just see who we have online. And uh, so please have a quick look. It's just one question, single answers only possible. So please, um, let's launch the poll. Okay, very good. So a few more seconds to make up your mind and then we shall close the poll and we shall share with you as well who we have online. Okay, we have a really nice balance actually online. So a very nice diverse audience, I, um, which I pretty much expected given the questions that have already come in. So to kind of set the scene and uh, give you a little bit of background, uh, potentially generate some questions. I see already some people are posting questions uh, in the Q&A section below. Um, I'd like, I prepared a few slides, just a little bit, after all it's in SEAT, to uh, give you a bit of context on the secondary slides. So let's have a look. I thought initially we'll have a look at the, um, uh, the private equity market overall. As you can see, in terms of assets under management, 
since 2000, the industry has grown quite, uh, quite regularly, quite consistently. Obviously, to some extent, driven by the strong performance of some of the primary uh, uh, private equity funds. So the investors, the LPs, really like private capital right now. Um, comparing it with the public market, as you can see also the private equity market, whilst in the 80s when I started in the industry, the uh, private equity market was very much a cottage industry, a niche industry. Those days are long gone. If anything, in the last 15 years, we've seen private equity market grow significantly faster than the public equity market. So detaching from, uh, between, uh, from the public equity side. The, um, I'd like to have a quick look at the drivers and the growth of the secondary market now. So secondary market is the resale market for investors' interests in the funds and as well in secondary, in direct investments. So the secondary transactions are one way for LPs to exit early from their investments if they were invested in any of the primary uh, funds. The market has very much grown in line with the primary market. So why? Because it obviously allows investors to achieve liquidity early, rebalance portfolios, modify exposures due to regulatory changes as we saw it uh, post the last global financial crisis, and also lock in returns on their private equity investments if and when they would like to do so. The uh, next picture just shows a little bit, again, the growth on the primary private equity fund side versus the secondary fund side as well. Now, before we go to our panel, I wanted to have just a brief uh, conversation on the kind of transactions that we see in the secondary space. Traditionally, secondaries were focused very much on LPs. So LPs are the institutional investors in private equity. And those LPs would, uh, if the, an LP wanted to step out of a primary private equity fund after, let's say, five or six years, the only way they could achieve that kind of liquidity was through a secondary transaction. Nevertheless, nowadays, uh, uh, secondaries have moved on, and we now see quite a lot of synthetic uh, transactions or direct secondaries, which basically requires the secondary buyer to set up potentially a complete new vehicle and to absorb assets from a first investor into that new vehicle. I will keep it at that uh, at this level. Anyone has any further questions after this, we will post, of course, the slides uh, online and the recordings, but also you're all very welcome to contact, obviously, Francois and Katrina on LinkedIn for more questions or send me a question as well. You're very welcome. So let's go to the next slide. And I added this slide because obviously in the, in the context of the present crisis we are in, um, people ask regularly, what will the impact be on the private capital space? Um, traditionally, we don't see impact on pricing until uh, further into a crisis simply because the adjustment is obviously not uh, as fast as in the public equity market. So I thought I'll share this kind of uh, timeline with you. As you can see in 2008, 2009, pricing for secondary assets in private equity went on average as low as 50 to 60 cents on the dollar. So obviously we have in the last few years, we've seen assets actually change hand at way over 100%. Um, of, uh, of the uh, of, uh, of NAV, net asset, net asset value. But we will have to see, and we can ask later on our panelists how they feel um, how this crisis will potentially be different from the last crisis. Now, in terms of risk profile for secondaries versus primary funds, we usually get that question, and I thought I'll just put this little, uh, this little picture in here. As you can see, when you look at the, uh, the, the IRR of secondaries versus the risk they're taking. So in terms of riskiness, clearly secondaries are in a lower quartile of the, uh, of the private equity space, the private capital space. 
but um, clearly have managed to achieve interesting IRRs. That obviously makes them interesting, especially also for first timers or first time LPs to the private equity space. And I thought uh, what would also be interesting, what obviously people, uh, investors are interested in, is what is the portion of funds that have returned a less than 1.0x? What does it mean? Which kind of, what funds, which portion of total private equity funds have returned less than the capital invested, i.e. a loss? And as you can see, uh, venture, no surprise, obviously is by far the most risky asset class and the largest percentage of venture funds uh, actually does return less than 1x to, to its investors, about 25 to 30%, uh, whereby secondaries is exactly on the other side of the spectrum. So I will stop here since we have some two fantastic panelists and I would like to start with our Q&A session. So let's kick off with um, the uh, maybe a bit more context. So having just given a brief introduction to secondaries, um, which is the resale market for LP stakes or stakes in primary private equity funds or in direct investments. Is there anything that you would, uh, that you would like to add to, uh, to the conversation? Katrina, sure. I'll, yeah. I'll take this one. Um, so as Claudia mentioned, the secondary market is growing quite quickly. Uh, and it's not just LPs that are driving that growth. It's being used by a variety of other participants, um, such as GPs. GPs are also using the secondary market for liquidity on their portfolio. Ultimately, it's to provide liquidity options for underlying LP. Um, but that is also driving the market. And with that, also, there is a growth of underlying or different illiquid strategies also coming into the secondary market such as credit, infrastructure, and real estate. Alongside that growth, the structures are also changing as well. So I know Claudia touched upon uh, LP positions or direct and synthetic uh, secondaries, but beyond that, you know, we're structuring quite interesting transaction structures um, for the capital that we put in. Yeah. Ultimately, it's backed by those underlying assets though. Yeah, and ultimately what you're providing basically is solutions to all the players in the secondary universe. Great. So, um, so what has kept you busy in the last, let's say, two or three months? So maybe Francois, tell us a yeah. little bit how, uh, how life potentially has changed in the last three months at, uh, at Color. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because I would start saying, you know, we are like everybody else. So actually what has kept us busy over the last two months is, um, you know, homeschooling. It is, uh, for some people, pampering. And that's, you know, a signal to, to Katrina and, and a few others. Um, so all of us, we've had to adapt to a very different normality. We've had to spend a lot of time on people. You know, as a business, we are as valuable as um, our people can be. And so, um, so there's been a lot of time making sure that everyone stays connected. Um, because to be able to make, in the end, the right investment decisions in such an, um, an environment where visibility is, is lacking dramatically, uh, you want to make sure that the team operates well as a, as a team. And so there's a lot of time spent uh, on that. And I just wanted to mention it because, again, it's, I think it's like, like everybody else, whatever the, the business you're in. Um, what uh, otherwise has kept us uh, busy is uh, obviously um, liquidity issues. Uh, you know, the secondary market at the end of the day has been a market developed for the purpose of bringing liquidity into a system which was not liquid. Uh, similarly to, you know, new cars and secondhand cars and any private market. Um, and uh, in the current environment, as I said, there's a massive lack of, of visibility. So what you want to um, identify is situations where you can be valuable for liquidity not only trying to uh, price and value assets where no one has much of a clue um, what the underlying business plans are. And so that has been, uh, that has taken quite a bit, um, quite a bit of, uh, of our time. And, uh, and then doing some uh, portfolio review. You know, all investors invested in, uh, in GPs, with GPs, 
uh, are spending time to try to understand a bit better. It is, um, it is difficult because at this stage, a lot of information is not available yet. Uh, we have lots of um, uh, people registered to the webinar in Noel who work across the private equity industry. So whether they are GPs or um, so on the investment side or operating partners or specialist consultants, many of them have not slept much over the last two months uh, because they are doing a lot of work at the portfolio company level so that we can get that information and understand better uh, you know, our existing portfolios. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so clearly, we, I mean, we cannot uh, ignore the topic of uh, crisis. And uh, maybe a good question would be to start off is how does, uh, how does the secondary space think about crisis? Um, is this something, is this an opportunity? Um, because obviously, I mean, as you already said, I mean, it opens the, um, it nudges investors to think about their portfolio, potentially rethink it and um, nudges them to potentially adjust it as well. So um, is this an opportunity for the secondary funds to acquire good assets um, at, a, at a discount, or is it rather a challenge for your existing portfolios? Yeah, so I think you know, you've, you've got this um, usual, um, usual phrase, uh, common phrase of never waste a, a crisis. Um, and so, um, you know, the crisis is there and all of us, we need to go through clearly a benefit of the cigarettes market compared to in particular buyout uh, and a few others is that there is always activity for us in the market. Um, so right now, if you work in, uh, in buyout, you probably don't really want to sell your assets because it's not the right time to optimize. And therefore, uh, there is not much activity going on from a transaction perspective. On the secondary side, um, because there are always uh, liquidity needs somewhere in, in the market, even though you end up with a slightly lower volume, probably for you know, six to nine months, um, you, you still have opportunities. So, um, uh, so that, is, uh, that is definitely uh, of interest. What is also quite interesting if you compare to what happened 10 years ago or 11 years ago uh, during and after the GFC is that uh, obviously in 2009, there were some uh, fantastic investment opportunities which delivered outsized returns. Um, but actually the investment horizon, uh, the opportunity for the investment horizon uh, went um, into 2010, 11 and early 2012. When, when you look at the performance of secondary funds during that period, it is typically 0 0.2, 0 0.3 times um, superior to the average of secondary funds performance. Mm -hmm which is very meaningful for us. You, know, you mentioned very rightfully that basically you don't lose money if you invest in, in secondary private equity, uh, but equally it's a market where you don't really deliver you know, 2x plus because of the diversification, the lower risk of the portfolios. So, um, so that is, that is a, a great opportunity. I think on the, on the existing uh, funds and, um, and the challenges, um, you know, everything is being challenged when there is a, a large um, economic crisis going on. Um, the benefit of, uh, of uh, secondary funds is the, is the diversification. And um, what we see in our portfolios where there is a lot of, uh, actually a lot of technology, a lot of healthcare, also because some of the uh, private equity managers, the direct GPs, had started focusing on those, uh, on those sectors. Uh, what you see is a number of companies performing very strongly. We've got many companies beating the budget in Q120. Which, which is unexpected in a way compared to many other sectors struggling very, very hard. Right. So, so talking about doing well or in the, in the terms of crisis, um, well, you, I showed the chart earlier on with regards to price, obviously this is what averages, price behavior over time in secondaries. And as we saw in the last crisis in 2008, 2009, prices uh, did drop quite significantly. As you said, this offered obviously opportunities, especially for first time investors to get into private equity. Have you seen the prices already adjust? I mean, have you seen conversations around prices or is it still too early in, uh, in the crisis? No, so we've seen that already. And actually we've seen that already a month ago or six weeks ago. You know, it is, uh, you know, people ad adapt and adjust very, very quickly. It's, I think it's quite important to have in mind that the crisis is very different at this stage. Um, the consequences might be similar, but uh, bear in mind that um, back in 2009, markets were down 50% sort of at the bottom. 
but the world was still going. Um, today, I, look, uh, I, I looked at yesterday's uh, S&P closing number. It's uh, you know 15% down from the top. So it's quite a different adjustment on valuations, but, but the world is top to a large extent. You know, it's, it's not 100% of the economy, which is, which is not running, but it's a very substantial part. And so all of a sudden, the adjustment of, uh, of valuations uh, is, um, is a very different uh, question because what matters is not necessarily so much discounts. What matters is which metrics do you use when no one has a clue about the business plan? For some of the assets, not all of the assets, um, but but the, if you know if you take a step back and you stay at a high level as an investor, you're thinking um, the world has stopped to some extent. Political decision. We're going into a recession, if not a depression, and um, and so there is no way it makes sense to buy at similar pricing to yesterday. And mm -hmm. so inevitably, if you buy, you buy at at a larger discount. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, but, and clearly, I mean, the crisis is a very different one from what we saw in 2008, 2009, and we'll have to see basically how this uh, pans out. Now, the industry overall has, uh, not just on the primary side, on the secondary side as well, we have quite a bit of dry powder sitting there on the sideline, basically. So dry powder is the industry term uh, for capital that has been raised, but is still waiting to be deployed. Do you yeah. see this, is this rather an opportunity or will this rather be a challenge? So I think um, I know I've been in private equity for a long time and uh, I'm a big uh, proponent of it, as I'm sure Thierry on, on the line of the chairman of uh, Invest Europe uh, will be. Um, I think um, this crisis, once again, will be a great opportunity to demonstrate the superiority of the model. And the superiority of the model is, uh, is, is basically having more people of quality uh, working on, on assets, which leads to better returns, better outcome. Um, what, so what will be a challenge, I think, will be um, returns in the context of the existing model. Because mm -hmm. again, if you, if you take a step back, you had sort of short-ish duration of holding periods before the GFC. The GFC comes, then it goes from four or five years into six years-ish. And now there's going to be a delay of exit for a number of portfolio companies, uh, GPs. So that six years will become you know, seven years plus. And so, so there should be at some point an issue with um, hurdle rate and carried interest to be discussed. I still think, I'm still convinced there will be uh, superior returns coming from the asset class compared to the others. Um, but I'm sure there will be um, many more discussions between LPs and GPs about the structure of the compensation. Yeah. So, um, yes, I mean, and, and I guess always in private equity, I mean, you always kind of, uh, um, you'll be torn, right? On the one hand, you have to, you had those high valuations in the last couple of years that allowed private equity to, to exit at super high valuations. But on the other hand, buying back into the assets, coming back into the market with newly funds, funds newly raised was, uh, was a challenge. Now, this may now swing the other direction. We may see I don't know, later exits, fewer exits, but uh, at least uh, on the pricing side, potentially we'll have an opportunity to, uh, um, to, to acquire assets uh, without paying the prices that one had to pay in the last, uh, in the last couple of years. Um, we had some interesting questions come in from the audience. So I'm paying attention to, uh, to the various uh, sources coming in. So maybe um, let's start with, why would investors sell during times of market distress? So Katrina, do you want to jump on that one? Um, so a reason why an investor would sell during, let's say, this period is really due to liquidity. Um, and so selling their assets when valuations are down is really a trade-off between how much they actually need cash. Um, but that's why they would access the market right now. Yeah, and I mean, you always have, um, like Francois mentioned as well, I mean, the, what, what happens in the public market obviously has an impact, right? So again, if the public market continues to drop, um, then there will be also the whole denominator effect around it, right? Exactly. People I just have to adjust their portfolio. Um, next question, what sort of assets become available early in a market down cycle and are they attractive? So it's actually a variety of assets. So if an LP needs cash or liquidity, um, they would look to throw out a lot of assets into the market to test appetite. 
uh, and gauge the pricing against those assets. And ideally, at the end of the day, they end up selling a mosaic in which they reduce the amount of loss they would need to take for that cash. Okay. Um, I'm just looking at also the questions that are coming in right now. Um, uh, let's inject one of those. What new types, or do you expect any new types of secondaries or transactions that may spring from this crisis? I mean, I would argue that the industry has actually developed in the last couple of years specifically in terms of uh, kind of structured solutions. But anything that you would expect from this crisis that may come out of it on the secondary side? Um, I'm happy to talk a little bit about that and let Francois jump in, but you're right, there are structures that are already in place that exist that we have looked at historically, but from a personal perspective of just thinking about what I've been working on for the last couple of weeks, you're seeing, of course, a rise of preferred equity type structures. Um, I know for anything I'm bringing to IC, any type of transaction I'm bringing, I'm trying to find ways to protect my downside, even if I'm capping my upside, just because as Francois mentioned, it's really hard to form solid views on these assets given the volatility in the market. And, you know, I don't even think the underlying companies or GPs understand the business plans going forward until we have a little bit more visibility. Um, so yeah, so anything that protects our downside, perhaps caps are up um, and different parts of the capital structure. Okay. Um, so, one of my slides, I showed uh, the cumulative growth on the primary side. And I obviously, I said that uh, the secondary market has grown kind of in line, in line with it, but there's still quite a big gap. So the primary market is still moving much faster ahead in terms of AUM. Um, do, you, um, do you feel that the secondary market has to catch up faster? Is there, is there more demand for it? I mean, I would on the other side say that we've raised quite large funds in the last few years on the secondary side. Do you think this gap will close? So, I mean, it's true that the primary capital raise is substantially higher, of course, than the secondary. But, you know, the primary markets have to develop first before the secondary. Um, another factor that could be driving that gap is also, um, different illiquid strategies that are also growing. So the credit, the infrastructure, the energy, which historically have secondary markets. Um, secondary markets have only started to develop in those industries. Hmm. So on a mature industry, yes, I agree that secondaries are, are keeping pace, and not outpacing it. Um, okay. If you look at the mature markets. Yeah, true. I mean, on the, prim on the primary side, we've seen all kinds of funds like coming up on debt and uh, yeah, various other underlyings that are yeah, reasonably new or in the greater scheme of things. Um, if, I, if I may, Claudia, if I may just um, interject here with an additional comment, because, you know, p human beings like uh, certainty in a way, and they like to, um, you know, framework and, and, um, and be able to feel they understand. Um, I think uh, even though the cigarettes market today is a big market, it is uh, better known, uh, publicized sometimes in the press, we are still in the very early days of this market. You know, it's very rare in any private market that the cigarette market would be only a few percentage points of the, of the overall illiquid market, which, it is, which is what we are today in the context of private assets. Um, so, um, so I think um, this uh, catch-up we're talking about, it's not a catch-up for the next couple of years. There will be a proper catch-up, uh, or we will, we will be done with the catch-up when the industry is, you know, north of 500 billion a year, and we were last year only 85. Um, yeah. So, uh, so there's, there's a massive growth uh, still to come for, uh, for these markets until it is, it is more mature. Yeah, and, and I guess also, I mean, as the primary market grows with the new players playing the primary market, those new players will have a need for rebalancing of portfolios and so on, or in general, adjusting their assets, right? So they will then in turn drive the secondary market as well, right? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, talking about the players, so um, um, both obviously, when you're, when you're sitting in a secondary fund, you obviously... Uh, have conversations with GPs, with LPs, Katrina mentioned before, various different players. Um, can you tell us a little bit what are kind of like the typical sellers and then also obviously the typical buyers of secondary assets? I mean, who, who do you kind of uh, engage with? 
Sure. So if you think of the sellers, they are typically anyone invested in these asset classes. Um, but on the larger scale, I would say the, the sellers are typically public pension plans, sovereign wealth funds, financial institutions, um, insurance company, asset managers, just because they've invested more substantially in the space. But on the smaller scale, you also have the, the family offices, the foundations, um, even the corporate pension as well. And if you look at the buyer universe, it's actually still quite concentrated. I would say, I think from looking at last year's numbers, 50% of the transactions were completed by, I believe it was six players. If you look at the top 80, 80 of the whole secondary market volume, it's only 15 players. And of that top 50 that are transacting on half of the market, it is right. people that have dedicated secondary funds. Uh, if you branch it out, another 30% are people with more primary funds, but with secondary buckets. Do you, do you see any differences around the globe? I mean, is this a, what you just described? Is this different in Europe? Is it different in the US? Is it different in Asia since we have an international audience? And not necessarily because we transact globally. Uh, and if you look at the underlying sellers, um, sellers may be diversified recently, but they're invested in funds globally as well. So it, the people that are selling, they don't differ that much from region to region. Okay, so let's let's stay with the with the LPs a little bit. Um, maybe 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 to Francois. I mean, you you're one of the longest standing um, LPs. Uh, so, sorry, secondary funds in the uh, in the space. So obviously, you've seen over the years how your how the demographics of your LPs has evolved. Um, I think your last fund did 170 LPs in the fund. Can you? Tell us a little bit whether how you've seen those changes and, and what, what kind of changes have been happening. Yeah, so so what what you see um, is a couple of uh, couple of trends uh, across the secondary market. Uh, the first one is that um, for a number of institutional investors um, today, and so that is basically people who've been in the industry for you know 15, 20 years in second investing in secondaries in particular. Uh, most of those people would have today a dedicated pocket within private equity for uh, secondary investments. So they would have X percent for buyout, X percent for venture, for infrastructure, and dedicated now for uh, secondaries because they do appreciate a different contribution to their portfolio cash flows compared to the other strategies. And so that is, that is very established. Um, then what you have as well, and it's been probably something more over the last 10 plus years, uh, so something you mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, actually, uh, Claudia, which is that um, a number of new entrants in private equity are being advised by most you know, consultants or advisors to, um, to have a disproportionate portion of their portfolio into secondaries to kickstart that program without facing the J-curve, basically. You know, that's, that's the main benefit when you get to, into a program. Um, so some of those people would have, you know, 50% plus of the program initially just in secondaries. Um, and then that, that evolves, obviously, over time uh, for something a bit more diversified. And, uh, and finally, I think the most recent trend we have seen is, um, is a substantial um, inflow of capital coming from retail slash high net worth individuals. Um, so we see that first because it's happening across private equity. Mm -hmm. And so that is not specific to second race. Uh, but I think what we've seen on top four second race is back to the slide you were showing earlier. And I think also uh, Katrina alluded to, because, um, because there is so little chance to lose capital uh, into this uh, sub asset class. And typically individuals are very sensitive to uh, preserving uh, capital. Um, it's, been, it's been a very successful product among that, uh, that category of, uh, of new investors. Yeah, actually, and I think I think that that's really interesting. Um, uh, just uh, to the comment that Francois uh, made on the J curve. So, in primary funds, usually um, you are locked up as an investor for uh, over ten years. So, ten years plus, um, because secondary funds obviously step into the primary fund at a later stage. It kind of cuts that time frame down, and it also um, allows you to jump over that part in the J curve where you have basically mainly negative cash flow as the money is deployed and you jump in as basically the J-curve starting to turn and you see basically better cash flows, given that we have quite a few of my students online. So I just wanted to remind them of that. Um, 
Okay, let me just have a look uh, over here. One uh, question that came up in terms of opportunities or promising, do you, which geo geographic areas or which sectors do you consider particularly promising or you think will be promising uh, in, the, in the next uh, 12 months? Any comments on that? I know it's a bit like looking in the crystal ball, but uh, we can we can give it a go. No one will hold you to it. That's fine. We we have a crystal ball actually at Color, but oh, we can share it. <laughs> Katrina, do, do you want to? Uh... Uh, well, I was going to say how we've invested the fund so far has done very strongly, and I mean it's probably because our largest GP led we have in our current fund is in technology in the SaaS space, um, and so that has I personally think that's an interesting sector. Um, of course, there's some sectors that are a little bit harder to predict how they will perform. Um, but I think anything in healthcare, um, technology, um, probably consumer would be harder to touch. But at the end of the day, if someone brought me a portfolio of assets, I would really look for diversification if I couldn't just find the sectors I like. Um, and I mean, as Francois spoke about earlier as well, it's really hard to predict the business plans of these companies. So at the end of the day, we're going to be looking at more of the seller dynamic um, and, and the reduced asset pricing that makes any of these transactions more attractive. But there probably is a price you're willing to pay for even sectors that are not as attractive right now. Okay, so as we're coming almost to the end, but we have time for one final question. And as I mentioned, since we have uh, quite a few of our MBAs online as well, any, can you give us any, uh, tell us a little bit about careers in secondaries? So what kind of, what profiles do you like when you hire or what profiles do you particularly look for? And what do you see also across the industry? How do, how do people kind of step into that? Yeah, no, I'm happy to take this one, uh, if only because more gray hair have been longer uh, in secondary as compared to, to Katrina. I think um, one, one element which is important to have in mind is that um, secondary is, is very quantitative as an investment strategy compared to buyout, for instance, where you would spend time on, I don't know, assessing the strategy to enter a new market for your portfolio company or the supply chain and so on. You know, we deal um, daily with uh, cash flows to a large extent. And so because of that, it's uh, definitely important for us to hire people who are, um, you know, skillful and, uh, and happy to, um, to talk about numbers all day long. Uh, so that element is something which is quite important. Um, having said that, we are conscious of, um, you know, of the benefit of avoiding having only um, you know, geek uh, people. I'm an engineer by training, so you know, not, not having only geek people in the team. Um, I chair the diversity and inclusion group at, uh, at Color, and we constantly try to think how to broaden um, the, um, the profile of, uh, of the people. Um, but you can't get away from the fact that at the end of the day, numbers are very important. Um, what, is, uh, what is, however, um, um, very interesting, and I think Katrina actually is a good, a good example, a good illustration, because she was initially in investor relations and then joined us into the investment team and, and obviously has been very uh, successful there uh, with, uh, with Connor. Um, so um, so there's, there's always, you know, when there's a will, there's a way. Um, so I think, um, I think it's important to, uh, to try to push. It's a very growing uh, industry, as I mentioned, which means that by definition, uh, resources are, are necessary. Um, you know, being comfortable again with numbers helps. Sure. Katrina, you want to add anything to it? What was, what was helpful when you look back sure. and um, what you wish you potentially would have had and uh, would have had more of? Well, I always tell people I'm probably one of the few with a non-traditional background besides Francois. I didn't, I didn't know he was an engineering background. Um, so I always say it's not rocket science. Um, it, you do have to like numbers. That, that is important because all we get is cash flows. It's not how we, how we change these businesses around and drive them. Back. But the other thing that's really important in secondaries is that ability to develop relationships because there's a lot of times when I'm talking to somebody that I think is a potential seller. Um, and in that conversation, it could flip very easily to actually we have capital we need to invest. So for anyone to be very successful in secondaries, I feel like you have to be a well-rounded athlete. Not only do you have to like the numbers, understand them, be able to model them, think of different structures, be creative, think on your feet, but you're gonna need to be able to relate to the counterpart and be able to flip from I thought I was here talking to you about potentially 
assets you might want to get rid of, but now instead I find you have capital deployed and also vice versa. I've gone into fundraising thinking I'm pitching them a fund, why it's good, and they're telling me I have no capital left to deploy. So you have to be able to transition very easily to support in any conversation. Okay. So I'm getting the uh, I'm getting the timeout sign from our team. So first, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Francois and thank you to Katrina, both of you for making the time to join us. And um, I basically for more background on the secondary markets, um, you you can go to Collar's website that we're showing on the screen right now with quite a few white papers on it, which will give you a bit more detail on it. Um, Francois and Katrina have also offered to, uh, to, uh, to take on questions, so please just contact them on LinkedIn, you will find them there. So on that, basically, I would like to thank everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. It was uh, fantastic. Thank you for sharing your questions, and I'm really sorry that we were not able to address all the questions, but as I said, we will be able to, uh, to hopefully answer them when I mean, you contact us directly. Okay, thank you very much. And on that note, I'll see you at one of our next webinars. Thank you, Claudia. Thanks, everyone.